everyone. I hope you can see and hear me. But uh, it's one past, so I think we can get going. Um, and welcome to this webinar on modal shift, and in particular, the new Green Alliance report coming out on Thursday called Moving On. Um, I'm Rosie Allen. I'm a policy advisor in the transport team here at Green Alliance and a co-author of the report that we'll be talking about today. So before we get going and I introduce our wonderful panel, a little bit of background on modal shift. Um, so despite ambitious progress with the electric vehicle transition, more needs to be done in the UK in order to fully decarbonize transport. Um, recently, a Green Alliance publication of the policy tracker, which was taking a kind of cross sector look at the government's progress on emissions, found that for transport, there is a policy gap, even with an ambitious SEV mandate, so an electric vehicle mandate, there is still a policy gap uh, in order to reach the emissions reductions required for carbon budget five. And um, our analysts found that if we matched Scotland's regional ambition and um, took on a UK-wide target to reduce car miles driven by 20% by 2030, then that would cover 90% of the policy gap that we would need in order to reach that carbon budget five level of reductions. So we see modal shift as the thing that can fill the policy gap for emissions reductions um, beyond electric vehicle transitions. So it's clear that modal shift is something that needs to take place to some extent in transport, but how do we get there? And that's the position we started off when we were thinking about this report, um, and our panel will be discussing that today. So in a moment, I will introduce Dr. Crispin Cooper first, who is a lecturer at the School of Computer Science and Informatics at Cardiff University, and he created the model that's the foundation of the report being released on Thursday. Um, then then uh, I will be... Um, outlining the key findings from the report, um, again, being released on Thursday. And then I will pass on to Hirakan Adogan, head of Car Free Cities at Possible. And finally, last but not least, we'll be joined by Ian Stewart, um, MP and chair of the Transport Select Committee. But um, before I get going with our wonderful panel, a little bit of housekeeping from me, which is that there is the chat function and the Q&A function. Um, on the Zoom at the bottom of your screen. And so if you are able to react to opening remarks and discussion from the panelists in the chat function, that's welcome. But if you want to ask a question directly to our panelists, then please use the Q&A function for that. And so with that out of the way, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Uh, Dr. Crispin Cooper, as I said, is a lecturer at the School of Computer Science and Informatics. Previously, he was a researcher at the Sustainable Places Research Institute, Crispin researches transport and broader socioeconomic models, including well-being. He created the model used in the report that's being released on Thursday. And Crispin, I believe you'll be demonstrating this modal shift model for us here today. Um, Crispin, I can't see your video, but I can hear you. I'm really sorry. Yeah, it's complaining suddenly that the video camera has gone amok. So I might have to do this without video, but I was going to show you slides anyway, if you can hear me all right. Um, so hi, yes, I'm Crispin Cooper from Cardiff University, and I've made this model uh, with also Paul Hagar. Um, this, uh, with, with our, our project brief overall was, as Rosie said, based on Green Alliance's previous reports. Um, what policy levers, what, what policies can we put in place to try and reduce uh, car mileage by about 25%? So. Um, what I want to invite you all to do is um, is play with the interactive model that we've made for this project. So um, you can see the URL there, um, and I'll put another link in the chat. In fact, um, I'm going to show you it now there. And where's the meeting chat? Um, there we go. So you will need a Google account to use this. And it says at the start, you have to, if you, it'll ask you to log in and you you have to click this play button and then wait about a minute for it to load up the model. Um, but the aim of this model is to give everyone, it's a very rough effort, it's a back of the envelope calculation about things you can do to um, uh, influence different types of travel behaviour. Um, you can choose all of England and Wales for it or any particular local authority. Um, I will flag up that this is, this is an economic model, not a transport one, so it does not know about the 
specifics of what goes on in any particular local authority, like whether there is enough rail infrastructure or any rail infrastructure to put people onto rail. Um, but you can start um, moving sliders around. Um, for example, you could um, put a 50% discount on rail, um, or 52 in this case, or you could maybe put a small amount of congestion charge on settlements of different sizes. Um, and so on and so forth. We have a number of policies you can apply, maybe a little bit of reduced trunk road speed limit. Um, and it gives you some outputs uh, for that. What you're trying to do is reduce the number of cars, which is uh, so the car mileage, which is equivalent, of course, to the car driver mileage, there being a one to one relationship between car cars and car drivers. So those policy changes I've just put in, uh, they reduced uh, car driver miles by 17%. Um, and that gives you a few graphs of where the where your trips are coming from, uh, how they break down by mode. So we see in this case that a lot of people doing medium length trips have uh, shifted to rail um, because we put a huge discount on the fares in that scenario. Um, and it shows you at the bottom some impacts in terms of who's paying for that in terms of uh, changes in car journey time and changes in car cost. So that's the my main message here. Um, I want this to be a hands-on seminar. So while we're talking, um, if you're able to to sign in and use that, um, any any problems, by the way, pop them in the chat for me. Um, but I'm very keen that you actually have a go. Um, so let's say a bit more about this model. Now I've introduced that. Um, I'm hoping the URL is still visible at the top there. So the aims of this model were a back of the envelope approximation for a wide variety of policy levers um, to assist in developing local transport plans. Um, and also to help inform that discussion more on that on a national level. Um, so, um, yep, it's it's a very simple model. Think of it as back of the envelope. And as I say, it is an economic model that doesn't include spatial detail. Um, and uh, one thing I would particularly highlight, in fact, is um, this section at the bottom called top down assumptions. So anything at the top under policy levers here, We've got uh, pretty good evidence as to what changing any of these sliders will do to people's transport behavior. Anything down the bottom is things that we're really interested in doing, like um, you know, looking at the amount of telework going on or how many perhaps increases in the level of cycling and so on. However, we do not have good evidence on how to incentivize those things. So um, you can, uh, for example, increase the amount of cycling in the model but it would be up to you to figure out how that happens in reality. We're just telling you uh, how the, the modal balance would change if cycling increased there. So that's the difference between a policy lever and, and an assumption. Um, again, um, with costs, be careful with the cost model, um, depending, uh, the cost model of this is, is incredibly approximate um, and I'm not going to stop to talk in detail about that. I can take questions on it later if you like, but the full details are in the report uh, link from the top of the model. Um, I can see a couple of questions in the chat. So, um, yes, great, fine, the link is shared. Um, key findings that sort of really top headlines that I got from, from building and running this model um, is that it's, um, most car miles come from medium length trips, generally in terms of transport behavior. Um, we do a lot of short trips, we do few long trips, but obviously the short trips have little impact because they're short and the long trips have lots of impact, but there's few of them. So whatever the opposite of a sweet spot is in between those two things, um, the sour spot um, is in this, this trip length of around, around 20 miles where most of, the, most of the car miles driven in the UK come from trips of around this length. Um, so uh, that's something that's worth thinking about as you create scenarios for reducing car miles. Um, in general, I've found uh, the evidence shows car trips are more sensitive to increased journey time than increased cost. Um, and when it comes to subsidizing public transport, um, subsidizing rail um, will get you um, a lot more reduction in uh, car miles driven than subsidizing bus tickets. So um, these are good things to know. Um, Rosie will later talk about the different uh, scenarios that Green Alliance have created based on this model. Um, and um, yeah, I might have had me in one of those uh, which focus more heavily on, on rail, I suppose. Um, I'm going to stop there. Um, are there any questions at this stage? And uh, I think sort of pass. Um, 
yeah, pass the torch back to you, Rosie, and the other panellists. Thanks very much, Crispin. That's really interesting. I'm always so, I love uh, tinkering around with that model. It was really fun to use it when making the report. And um, I hope that all of the attendees get a chance to have a go with it after this session. So make sure to copy down that link. Um, it's really fun to have a tinker around with it, as I said. But um, speaking of the report, uh, now I'm just going to outline some of the scenarios, as Crispin mentioned, that we used this model to create when we were writing the report that will be out on Thursday, moving on. Um, so the starting point for us with this piece of work was following on from a previous Green Lights report, not going the extra mile, that found that between 20 and 27 percent reduction in car miles would be needed given the current pace of uptake of electric vehicles in the UK. And so our first port of call was commissioning Public First to undertake some polling and focus groups about how people felt about their cars and how people felt about policy levers that might get them to um, reduce their car driving journeys. Um, and the findings, as you may or may not be surprised to hear, were that people are very attached to their cars. Um, people find them convenient, affordable, and are used to driving them. Um, and one thing that came out of those focus groups that was really apparent was that people really want to see public transport improvements and alternatives being made accessible and available before there are any policy levers that disincentivize people to try to get them out of their cars. They really wanted to see alternatives available first. And so with that information, we knew that a successful approach to modal shift would require a kind of mixture of several policy levers across the board in order to encourage people out of their cars positively, like the carrot to see here in policy terms, and then the stick, so disincentivizing people from driving their cars for car journeys where there are more sustainable modes available. And um, um, so thinking about that mixture of policy approaches that is going to be needed, we um, worked with Dr. Crispin Cooper to make that model that you've just seen, which allows the user to apply a mixture of policy levers all at once and see what the output would be for the transport system. And so from that, we created uh, a few sets of pairs of scenarios or approaches to modal shift, all looking to get to a 25% reduction in car miles driven place and um, using a mixture of measures to get there. And so we had a set that focused on disincentivizing and incentivizing. So things like road pricing to disincentivize car journeys, and then incentivizing by reducing public transport fares, for example. We looked at scenarios that had a local focus versus a national focus. So things where local leaders could be really ambitious with kind of knowledge of their local area or things that required national implementation, like for example, trunk road speed changes. Um, and then we ultimately came to a balanced approach, which we believed was a good example of how the model can be used to create a reasonable mixture of policy approaches that had um, you know, the right balance of incentive and disincentive and so on in order to get to that 25% modal shift place. Um, and then what we came to during that process, our recommendations from the report that were going to be released on Thursday, is a national target of at least 20% reduction in car miles, as um, I mentioned with our policy tracker finding that this would cover the most of the policy gap to get to that carbon budget five place. Um, we also recommended that an independent commission on road pricing be established to report to DFT and the Treasury on an equitable implementation of road pricing. Um, we thought that this was an important recommendation from the report because I've mentioned a little bit about disincentivizing levers and how controversial that they can be with the public, but um, that has to be balanced against the need to um, replace some of the revenue that will be lost from fuel duty as um, electric vehicles are increasingly taken up and um, fuel duty revenue for the government will be decreased. So we saw road pricing as one lever that could be used to replace government revenue, but then also encourage some level of modal shift. But we wanted to make sure that that was balanced against public acceptability, which we hope that our focus group framing managed to do. 
Um, we also recommended that any revenue that is made from some kind of road pricing scheme be used to be invested back into public transport and active travel to make sure that those alternative transport modes were available before we asked people to switch from using their cars so much. And finally, we um, suggested that improving local authority access to the data that they need to make quantifiable carbon reductions as there is a new local transport plan process. And um, this will enable some of those local levers which can be um, implemented with more effect at a local level to be um, managed more accurately with access to the right kind of data and to be able to use models like CRISPINs that we've seen here today and create their own kind of versions of that with knowledge of their local areas. So I hope that gives a kind of broad flavor of the um, report that we'll be releasing moving on. And um, I'll make sure that that is uh, shared with all the attendees in an email follow up after this session. Um, and after that, I will be passing on to Hira. So um, Hira will hopefully be talking about some work that gives us an idea about what um, a future with less cars could look like. Um, Hira Khan Adogan leads Possible's landmark program to kickstart the process of making private cars obsolete in our cities, accelerating the move to zero carbon, Britain, built by and for everyone. And Hira is going to talk to us a little bit about Possible's work in this regard. Thanks. Lovely. Thank you, Rosie. I am just going to try and share my screen. Um, is that working? Can everyone see that? I'm going to assume you can. OK, so um, over the past three years or so, the Car Free Cities campaign has been working in Birmingham, Bristol, Leeds and London to put forward the positive case for urban traffic production and work with local communities, particularly those who are most harmed by the effects of mass car dominance, to co-design and deliver changes to their own streets and encourage and inspire local decision makers to raise ambitions and accelerate change in our cities. So what have we learned over that time? Uh, the first thing is that change is hard and opposition is inevitable. If you're finding it difficult, the Goodwin Curve is here to let you know that that's normal. At first, a new idea is seen as ludicrous, then people are won over, in theory, by the arguments. But as soon as plans and details emerge, there is loud opposition. But when people start enjoying the benefits of said change, support grows and opposition dissipates. So as an example, there's been quite the media frenzy about low traffic neighbourhoods. Poll after poll will show support more than opposition, but criticisms from a few are loud and can be very, very hostile. Modal filters, modal filters as used to create LTNs are not new, and councillors introducing LTNs say nobody ever writes to them asking to have existing filters removed. This gives a clue about the nature of LTN controversy. So we surveyed nearly 300 households uh, on streets with historic modal filters and found that they are overwhelmingly popular. So people's views about traffic filters aren't fixed. They trend towards greater support following lived experience with the change. And that's what this uh, lovely chart is showing. Um, where the status quo is a filtered street, residents focus on the problems that would be caused if that were to change. So change meets resistance, no matter the starting point. We've been collecting stories of change from all around the world, and you can have a look online at the 25 plus case studies which bring to life the pattern in the Goodwin Curve. So the one big pattern is initial fears about potentially negative impacts from traffic reduction prove unfounded. Once bedded in and the benefits have been realised, people don't want to go back. So what we need is political leaders who practice good communication, are courageous, tenacious and see things through. The second thing we learned is uh, where are we going? So we're creatures of habit. We rely on familiar patterns and routines to navigate our lives. So the prospect of a new and uncertain future is daunting. It's difficult to envision something that is completely outside of our current frame of reference. So our Car Free Visions project took people on a journey from fear to the future. We worked with a diverse cross-section of locals in each of our cities to develop new visions of their communities free from car dominance. These residents were not climate campaigners. They were everyday people, many of them drivers themselves. 
And over the course of three weekends, we unpacked and explored the problems caused by cars, the disproportional impact on marginalized communities, the definitions of a car-free city, inspiration from cities around the world, and examples of equitable public spaces. They came up with these visions, they believe in these visions, and they launched them to great fanfare. They embraced that fear to future journey. And if anybody wants to understand the importance of these visions, we polled people to garner support for the before and after images. We asked over 1,000 Londoners whether they would support the pedestrianisation of Hyde Park Corner to link it up with Green Park. And 49% agreed, 27% disagreed, and 23% said they don't know. We then presented them with this image and asked, imagine that a pedestrianised Hyde Park Corner looked like the below image. To what extent would you support or oppose the pedestrianization of Hyde Park Corner? And lo and behold, support shot up with 72% agreeing with only 10% opposing. So we have to show people where we're trying to take them. And then the final thing is small interventions for big impact. Last January, we followed a diverse group of 10 regular drivers with a variety of mobility needs, backgrounds and experiences most of them parents, some of them disabled, as they tried to go car free. They completed surveys, daily travel logs, and recorded their experiences via videos and voice notes. They recorded one week of usual car use and then three weeks going car free. At the end of the trial, we analyzed all of this data to find most of our participants actually reduced their carbon emissions and saved money. After the trial, all participants reported using their cars less or using alternative modes for some journeys. We had a few stars who even sold their cars off the back of this experience. Julia here is living her best life, turning uh, her old car into solar panels for her house. Michelle sold her car. Joe went from a two car household to a one car and importantly EV household. And Funmi didn't sell her car, but loved cycling so much and had a great piece in The Guardian about how it's transformed her life. Nathaniel similarly loved the experience so much that he now wants to buy his own bike for his commute and has since helped us with more campaigning on traffic reduction. So the learnings and findings from this cohort informed our public going car free challenge, which launched in July 2022. We got 1000 people to participate in the month from all across England. 98% of people who completed the post-challenge survey said they're planning on reducing their car use for good. So this demonstrates how a short intervention to reorganize routines can create long-term behavior change. So change is difficult, but it's happening right here, right now in small ways that will lead to big transformations. Thank you. I'll stop sharing. And hand back to Rosie, I think. Thanks very much, Hera. That was amazing. I always love Possible's work for making you realise what a future with less cars could look like. Um, and it reminds you that it isn't an abstract policy, especially those visuals there, really lovely. Um, and uh, moving on, uh, next up, we have another perspective on the national transport picture. I'd like to introduce, introduce next uh, Ian Stewart. Ian Stewart is the MP for Milton Keynes South and has been in Parliament since 2010, where he served on the Transport Select Committee. In November 2022, he was elected as chair of the committee, whose role it is to scrutinise government and industry performance on national transport. So, Ian, without further ado, I hand over to you. Hello. Sorry, I'm just sorting out my video. I, I can hope you can see me now. Um, well, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, contribute uh, to this webinar uh, and also my congratulations on uh, producing uh, this report. Uh, it's some really interesting uh, findings. Um, I think that the first thing that struck me was that you've looked at uh, issues uh, holistically. Uh, it's very often the case in, in transport that issues are looked at in, in silos and there, there's a bus issue, there's a train issue, there's a traffic issue and so, and so on. But you know, we do need to look at this, uh, th these issues across the board uh, and, and think you know, through how making an intervention in one area uh, will, will impact on others. 
Uh, so I think there's some, some really important ideas there. Um, it also touches on a number of uh, recent current and future inquiries that uh, my committee is looking at. Um, we completed, uh, before I took over chairmanship of the committee last year, we did complete a, uh, an inquiry into road pricing. Uh, and we actually came up with the same conclusion, uh, well, not, not the only conclusion, but one of the principal recommendations that you have, uh, and that is to uh, establish an independent commission uh, to look at how uh, a road pricing system might work. Uh, unfortunately, the government haven't really engaged with us on that. Uh, their, their basic response to us was that uh, they don't currently have a policy to introduce road pricing, uh, which I, I was disappointing uh, and I think a little short-sighted uh, because I don't think doing nothing is an option uh, for this country or, or, or indeed many countries around the world. Uh, because as, as has been highlighted uh, in the discussion already, uh, the, the shift from internal combustion engine cars to electric vehicles uh, without any other changes in, uh, in fiscal policy is going to lead to a sizable black hole in the public finances. Uh, there are various estimates uh, for this. I, I think your report predicts uh, 28 billion uh, pounds uh, deficit. Uh, I've heard reports of 40 billion. Uh, to put that into some context, that's the, the budget for the housing department or the, the transport department itself. So these are big sums of money and uh, governments, plural, uh, as in, in lots of countries, are going to have to find a way of uh, replacing that revenue. Uh, even if it's just on a revenue neutral basis uh, from, you know, to compensate for the loss of uh, fuel duty revenue. Now, there's a number of ways you can do that. You could increase the, uh, the sort of fixed costs uh, of owning a vehicle with uh, an increase in vehicle excise duty, or you could move to a, a system of road pricing. And within road pricing, you then get into the debate of, uh, you know, is it just a fixed per mile charge uh, anywhere in the country, or do you start to differentiate between types of journeys, times of days, uh, types of vehicles? So, you know, someone driving a very small vehicle down a, a country lane in North Devon, uh, you know, at three o'clock in the afternoon would pay significantly less than someone driving a gas guzzling. SUV around the M25 at eight o'clock on a Monday morning. Uh, how you know? So, what would the parameters be uh, for introducing that change? There, there are very complex and controversial issues to address in that, and that's why the the, the transport committee, as you have, uh, has come up with the recommendation of a uh, an independent body to look into that and, and prepare a series of options uh, for government to take. Um, being politically realistic, I don't see much movement on this, uh, this side of a general election. Uh, I, I just don't think political parties, uh, the mainstream ones, will want to open this controversial box uh, of issues uh, this side of an election, uh, when there'll be plenty of other controversial issues. But it's not going to go away, uh, and it's increasingly going to be a potent uh, financial issue for governments of whichever political stripe. Uh, so I think it, it, it's an issue that we will have to uh, uh, revert to. Um, the other sort of uh, thought that I had on reading uh, the report is, you know, you're absolutely right to focus on personal car use. But I think a, a, an important part of the equation is how we uh, look at moving goods around uh, the country and in our towns and cities. Uh, because increasingly we're moving to uh, a, a sort of on-demand uh, you know, appetite for, for uh, all sorts of products uh, delivered to our homes. And that's one of the fastest growing areas of vehicle use in towns and cities. Uh, and I'm as guilty as the next of ordering things from Amazon and other places uh, and the vans trundle up and down. 
So I think we also have to look at that part of the, the mix uh, in, in how we decarbonize uh, transport. Uh, and there are lots of innovations uh, there for those last mile de deliveries. Uh, I represent uh, one of the Milton Keynes seats and we've got these Starship delivery robots. They don't go on the roads, they're on the, the pavements and uh, pathways. Uh, and you know, it's relatively local goods at this point, but there's potential to extend that. Um, the other um, area that uh, I think your findings will uh, make an important influence into the work of the committee uh, is a couple of future inquiries I'm hoping that we will do later in the year. I don't have agreement with from my colleagues to do these yet, but so it, with that caveat, but I hope we will uh, hope we'll be doing it. And the two are one, looking at the balance of uh, powers and relationships between central and local government, because uh, as your report and the, the conversation we've had thus far uh, indicates, a lot of the interventions will be made by local authorities. But then some of the big levers of uh, uh, fiscal intervention will be held by central government. Uh, so we need to look at how those balances are going to work uh, in tandem. Uh, and the other inquiry I'm looking at doing is the looking at transport at a more strategic uh, perspective um, and looking at the, the appraisals of uh, different transport projects in a wider uh, context, not just looking at a narrow benefit cost ratio that some transport scheme costs X pounds to build and will generate Y revenues, but looking at, uh, as your report also indicates, what are the, the benefits in other areas as well. So if you, you know, reduce air uh, pollution and increase the, the quality of air, what are the health benefits of that, both you know, for individually or for, for people, uh, but also the potential savings it could make to the health system. Uh, so looking at trying to appraise projects on a much wider basis uh, is, I think, an issue that uh, I would like my committee to, to consider. Uh, and some of the ideas you've come up with would be, would be very helpful indeed uh, to, uh, to shaping that work. Uh, so I'll pause there. I, I don't want to take up too much time and uh, leave uh, as much time as possible for questions and answers. Uh, but I'll just conclude by saying thank you for producing this report and, and inviting me to comment on it. Uh, and I look forward to the discussion uh, that will follow today and in the, the weeks and months and years ahead. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Ian. That's great. And really welcome your reflections on the report. And I'm particularly interested to hear about what might be coming up for the Transport Select Committee. Um, and so now shifting gears, I think all our panelists for the opening remarks, um, but I'd like to pose a question. Um, this first question uh, might be best addressed to you, Ian, actually, um, but other panelists are welcome to jump in. Um, on that, is a national target required to encourage modal shift? Um, can we learn from Scotland and Wales who've introduced their own regional targets? Or is it possible that local implementation can take place or policy levers can be pulled on their own without that national target overseeing it? Um, I'm always a bit hesitant about setting specific targets. Um, because that, that, that almost, I think it can almost be distracting from looking at the bigger picture. Uh, and once you hit that target, then that's job done uh, and you don't need to think about it again. I'm more in favour of looking at where the, the sort of the, the incentives can be built into the system. Um, and I think by and say if, if we're able to move to a wider appraisal of uh, the benefits of, of a particular scheme, I, I think that will generate the reductions uh, in themselves. Uh, and let, let me sort of try and give a, a, an example of this um, relevant to my constituency. Uh, at the moment, we are building the East West Rail Line which event the, the bit that's under construction connects Milton Keynes to Bicester and Oxford. Uh, and that will, I, I'm certain, uh, achieve a modal shift. 
Uh, more controversial is the, the second part of it, which is connecting eastwards towards Cambridge, because it's a much more expensive uh, project and uh, basically a new line has to be built. They can't reopen uh, the old one. And there's a lot of opposition there. And the BCR in itself is fairly marginal. But when you add in the environmental benefits, uh, the wider economic opportunities, uh, the case uh, you know, is, is a no-brainer. Uh, but we're not quite there yet. So I think the, the, rather than sort of setting a specific uh, car reduction target, it's being able, having that mechanism to appraise transport on a much broader uh, basis, uh, I think will be the better way of, of, of achieving uh, the, the, the outcomes that we want to see. Thanks, Ian. That's great. I, and I agree. I think that a tra although I think a target could be useful, we obviously recommended it. I think that it comes from the same approach of wanting to see the transport system in the round that can be most helpful and most important. Um, moving on to questions now um, by our attendees. Um, we have a question in the chat that says, is it possible to assess the impacts of greater modal integration, i.e. hubs, timetabling, bike storage, and e-scooter charging with other modes of transport? Have a feeling this would be important to better bus uptake and walking cycling. Uh, Crispin, I wondered if you might mention the integration element of the model. Yes, and actually one thing I realised I forgot to mention in when, we put, when I presented this model at the start, I was a bit stressed out by my lack of camera. Um, was that um, this model's the result has been a very agile development process. So um, I originally, um, you know, Green Alliance asked uh, us to come up with some scenarios. And I said, well, I think it's better to, for the scenarios to be generated by um, the experts in sustainable transport policy making. Um, and what I'd like to do is simulate how those scenarios will play out. So um, we, we had we got to about three versions of the models sort of playing ping pong with the, the specification and the different policy levers we could pull and all of green alliances stakeholders would say what about this what about that have you considered um various different policy levers and we'd get those ones done that we could um although in a lot of cases we it, there are seriously research gaps and we lack the evidence to to fully say so um i'd like to basically highlight the value of the model as the end result already of this process of to and fro um and as such, I do see that as but it, it may well form the prototype for um, better models in future that that do incorporate these extra levers. I'd be really interested in looking into that um, and with all the spatial detail in there. Um, so going back, I think I put an answer in the chat on integrated transport um, that uh, there is a box for integrated transport, which um, is based on evidence relating to things, you know, combined ticketing and timetables, um, things such as the Oyster card. Um, um, and that's as far as we go at the moment. But yeah, particularly with, um, for example, the potential of things like e-scooters or bicycle infrastructure to link into transport hubs and therefore allow people to do much longer journeys sustainably because short, for example, short bicycle journeys and are just never gonna cut it in terms of the amount of distance reduction we need. Um, I think these are really important things to model in future. Thanks, Crispin. And speaking of the model being shaped by sustainable transport policy experts, um, Hira, I was wondering whether you might also be able to comment on the ability of integration between modes and how that might encourage people to take the bus and other sustainable forms of transport. Yeah, absolutely. I think what we need to do is get away from this idea that some people are drivers and some people are cyclists and forevermore they will uh, battle to to death i mean um taking away the identity part of this i think is key you know just saying that we're all walkers occasionally you know driving is the right choice for certain journeys but also walking cycling taking the bus wheeling is the right choice for others um and that's where i think you know shared mobility does have a really key role in this in in, in making multimodal journeys a lot easier for for people um and I, th I think that's the future to kind of make people see that what we need to move away from is owning a car and then just using the car for everything. But what we need is the right tool for the job um, and, and kind of asking what is the right tool for this particular job and this particular journey. 
Thank you, that's really interesting. Um, we've had another question come through in the chat for Ian. Um, this is, what are the political conditions necessary for politicians to properly investigate good road pricing? Will it always be too controversial for politicians to seek to address? It's a very good question. Um, I, I, as I said in my comments earlier, I don't think we're going to see much movement on this uh, this side of an election, because I, I think it's probably going to get parked in the too difficult, too controversial one. But reality will creep up um, and we are going to have to find those answers, because, as I say, it's a massive hole in, in the public finances. And when there's demands on the one side for more spending on uh, just about everything uh, on, and you know demands for lower taxes on the other, uh, having a gap of 30 to 40 billion uh, in the fin nation's finances is going to concentrate minds. So uh, it will be addressed. I just don't think it will be immediately. Um, and th that's why I, I agree with your recommendation of having some sort of independent body uh, there to to work through all the the different issues and options uh, that are there because it's not a you know it's not one single uh, option that, that that could work uh, and it may be a combination of of, of, of different measures uh, so you know it, as I say I'm being perfectly honest with you I don't think we're going to see any movement on it this side of a general election uh, but afterwards I think it will have to be addressed pretty quickly. Thank you very much. That was some political insight there, um, which is very useful. Um, thinking about road pricing. Uh, the next question I have in the chat is directed at Crispin. Um, this question says, did the study consider the potential benefits of large scale smarter choices? So behavior change initiatives as modeled by DFT in the sustainable travel towns program in the early 2000s. Sorry, you're just on mute there. I am on mute, yeah. I'm going to have to, I've only just seen that. I'm going to have to time, take time to consider that. Um, and it, it might be one, oh, sorry, I am unmuted. Yes, might also be one to loop my um, RA into who was looking at the literature in a lot more detail than me for this. But we can come back to you on that, James. Thank you. No problem. Moving on to our next question, we can return to that one, is... um. I think, uh, Hira, this might be a good question um, for you with your experience on how people feel about their local areas and reducing car travel. Is there good practice guidance on publicity for new measures for such as LTNs? So how can these measures be passed and made acceptable to the public? Um, I was actually in the process of typing an answer to, to Kay, who put it in the chat. So I think Consultation, particularly with disabled people's organizations, is really important. Um, but it's a, a, I would say there are certain instances, and I live in Tower Hamlets, for example, where consultation is being used as a way of, it, it's just an endless consultation until the council gets the answer that they want. Um, and, and, you know, like I said, whatever measure you will bring in, you will experience um, resistance, you know, and, and, and potentially very vocal resistance. I think what we need is for policymakers to understand, really get on board with why these changes are necessary and to feel supported in that they're doing the right thing for future generations and their current residents. Um, we have a messaging guide on how to discuss LTNs. Uh, we've done loads of research on what, how LTNs LTNs benefit, you know, uh, people living on the roads. And I think the criticism around LTNs around, you know, oh, but they just push traffic onto onto major roads. That's not the, the you know, the, the, the uh, main roads and major roads need uh, different policy measures to tackle that. That's not the purpose of LTNs. LTNs work for, and they're doing what they're meant to do. And let's bring in alternative measures to tackle uh, traffic increase on 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 the other roads um but yeah I, I could talk about LPNs all all day long Kay um drop me an email and I'd be happy to help thank you that's great um nice to hear about your experience with LTNs um this next question in the chat 
is um, might be best answered by you, Ian. This is um, regarding the issue of persuading the government to adopt the recommendation to set up a commission on road pricing. Would it help to negotiate a cross-party consensus on this? For example, if the Labour front branch were to forge a behind-the-scenes agreement with people like Hugh Merriman and Jesse Norman, that the two parties will both come out in support of such a commission, might that help to get the idea over the line? Another political one for you there. Uh, yes, I, is a short answer, um, because this, as in many uh, transport issues, you know, the, it has to be done on a consensual basis, uh, because the duration of them will last multiple governments and parliaments. So, you know, it's not something I think you could chop and change uh, with a change of government. So, yes, I, I would very much hope that there can be that open dialogue uh, between the different front benches uh, and, and at least, you know, have agreement to set up this sort of commission uh, to, to look at uh, in detail the, the different options. You know, that could be done fairly quickly. Uh, and because it would, uh, you know, commissions take time to go through all the evidence and prepare the reports and conclusions. Uh, so I, I don't see any reason why that couldn't be initiated now and, and have it ready for the next government, uh, whoever that might be, uh, to, you know, to, to have something concrete in front of them to, to start to implement. Thanks, Ian. Some homework to take away um, for those in the political sphere, thinking about road pricing and taking it forwards. Um, this next question uh, might be best answered by Crispin. Um, I know that this is potentially one of the limitations of the model, but also an area that um, you found interesting. Uh, we have a question in the chat that to what extent is an uplift in railway capacity needed to be able to offer reduced rail fares or an, and attract new passengers? Wondered if you'd like to pick that up. So um, I'm glad you asked me that, actually, because I, I did type a quick um, answer in the chat saying it. We, so our model does not model rail capacity limits at all. It, um, it tells you how many more passengers you might expect um, on the rail if you reduce the cost by so much or increase the frequency. Um, and it's up at the moment, it's up to the local authority users to know whether their rail services have that capacity. Um, the cost model could potentially um, scale to putting on more rail services but it, somewhere like London where potentially the lines themselves are at capacity there's it's it's up to you to know that and, and so the um it, I was, was going to say it's quite interesting I mean we had this discussion Rosie early, uh, last week when the, the report coming out from Green Alliance that was put together by the Green Alliance stakeholders sets actually a, in the balanced scenario a very modest um proposal for a five to ten percent I think um reduction in rail fares um, and perhaps that reflects the, the London centric nature of, of Green Alliance and the stakeholders, because coming from a rural area, um, I'd be dragging that all the way up to a 50 percent discount because I'm often sat on empty trains at my way to and from work. So, um, yeah, basically, this is very local. Um, and um, I think that needs to be taken into account by the users of the model at the moment. I would love to have the capacity to model rail capacity as well. I think it's a very key question as it's it does have such large potential for um, replacing long, longer distance trips. Thanks, Chris. Been really interesting to hear about modeling rail capacity and how it can be used. Again, I think it's tricky. We've got that balance with the report between trying to have different level out different approaches to modal shift and get that political solubility as also um, public acceptability and encouraging alternative modes but um but that's really interesting and um, we have another question in the chat that um perhaps might be um best answered by Hera um and this is um, to what extent, oh, sorry, rather, how should we work with policymakers to get policies for public transport and cycling implemented? So about bridging that gap between kind of public interest and policymakers and trying to make that connection there. Yeah, I think there's a lot in this. I think um, getting policymakers 
you know, used to the idea that this is a this is this is a hot topic. You know, you will experience backlash, but also supporting them. And I think that you know, civil society sometimes goes missing when when policymakers need kind of support in implementing these measures. We need to be there with the evidence and showcasing uh, that you know the silent majority making that really um, apparent to people why we're doing this. It kind of goes back to my presentation around, you know, change is hard, opposition is inevitable, but showcasing to people where we're trying to get to, why we're doing this, convincing them of the arguments is a key part of that. And slowly, slowly, people's minds will change. I, you know, like I said, we took 10 regular drivers. All they needed was the opportunity and the support to actually say, and I think the other thing was a lot of these people before if you ask them before, do you need your car? They would have 100% said yes, because most of them were parents. Like I said, some of them were disabled. Afterwards, so, you know, so many of them could see it was a, it was a matter of habit. It was a matter of, you know, a completely different landscape that they just never engaged with before. Um, just demonstrating that change is possible. I think that's another, that's another thing, but this is, this is something that we kind of need to chip away at. Um, you, you can't just say your message once and hope that people will get it. You have to keep repeating the same messages over and over and over again. Yes. Yes, and of course that's something that we're thinking at, thinking about at Green Alliance too, about how to bridge that gap between the policy and the policymakers. Um, this question um, is addressed to Ian. Um, I wondered, uh, is there any challenge politically to the prevailing notion that increased car use and road capacity is necessary for economic development or an inevitable consequence of economic development? In other words, is modal shift seen as the enemy of the economy? That one's from the chat. I have one comment from the academic side on that, which is um, that for, for long it's been a, a assumed that um, yes, more accessibility um, improves economic development, but um, the the academic literature is still really not clear. It's one of those things that's it's very very hard to tease out the difference between cause and effect. Uh, um, are some places better connected because um, they had more money to invest in transport, or or is it, is it the other way around that making them more connected um, has made them wealthier places? Um, there was a review by a guy called Steve Melia in Bristol a few years ago about this, and I've done some work on it. So. I can't speak to the politics, but academically, it is not a cut and dry question. Thanks, Crispin. That's really interesting to get that perspective. And Ian, I wondered if you wanted to follow up. Sure. Um, I think it, it links back to, to the point I made earlier about having a wider appraisal mechanism uh, for uh, different transport investments, uh, because, you know, and I'm, I'm not talking just about uh, road uh, networks here, but there are very clear examples of where you put in a bit of transport uh, infrastructure to uh, increase connectivity that does generate uh, wider economic uh, benefits. Uh, to give one example, uh, in Scotland, uh, when they opened or reopened the Borders rail line from Edinburgh, uh, down into the borders, uh, the, the the generation of new housing, new businesses, uh, and so on has been uh, quite phenomenal. And, and usage of the line is way above uh, what uh, was was forecast. And they've actually realised they made a mistake in making it effectively a single track railway instead of a, a double one. Uh, so you know that's one example of where uh, improved connectivity. Uh, does lead to uh, enhanced economic activity. Uh, so, you know, but uh, my basic point is that we, I think we need to take a more holistic view of looking at how uh, transport uh, investments are appraised uh, and look at their, their impact on a whole range of things, on, on the environment, on housing, on the economy and, and so on, uh, and then be able to make a more balanced judgment as to whether a uh, particular uh, project should be given a go ahead or not. 
Thanks very much, Ian. That seems to can be I, a recurring theme. Can I chime in to agree with that? Yeah, that firstly, that the, definitely the balanced appraisal is a, a good point for the future. Um, although, and, and it's, it is a good point that in certain local schemes, it's long been known in transport that if you increase the connectivity of a place, then more um, economic activity will happen there. Um, so I'm not disagreeing with that either, but the, the partly unresolved question is whether that's economic activity that would have just happened somewhere else and has been displaced to where you built that transport link. So so how much of that is actually new on a national scale is is still an open question, although it certainly it can make a difference locally. Thanks, Ian and Chris Bim, both for your input there. Really interesting to get the political and academic version on the same issue. Um, Hira, I think this question um, regards your presentation earlier on the Goodwin curve. Um, there is a question about language. Is there a point at which a phrase or especially an acronym like LTN, for example, becomes so toxic with negative associations that it's worth reconsidering the language that you're at if you're at that low point in the Goodwin curve or is it better to persevere through? I mean, I think that's an age old question, really, and it probably cuts across all sorts of different issues. I mean, I think we had this sort of same thing with feminism, you know, where people are like, oh, but what does it really mean? Should we change, you know, if it's been co-opted, should we change something? And it's sort of like, the word is the word, maybe, and, you know, use it, don't use it. I And I, I think I put out a tweet a while ago where I was like, you know, call it whatever you want. I don't really care. The, the point is, you, sh you shouldn't have masses of, of cars going down, shortcutting down minor roads. That, that's not the point. That's not why they were built. Um, so, you know, I, I think whatever works in your local area, you know, call it what you want. And like I said, in Tower Hamlets, they did try to do a rebranding um i don't think it worked and i think sometimes there's the um it can come across as disingenuous and 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 can kind of feed into you know the rhetoric that they're trying to do this surreptitiously people are kind of going around the back door now they're rebranding it etc cetera, etc cetera. so i think just be what i would love to see is for politicians to just be open and honest that we need urban traffic reduction well we need traffic reduction and, and you know where we're going to get it is through urban traffic reduction and and then why we need to look at different mechanisms to get there but i think in some quarters there is still this idea that we can carry on we can carry on driving and continuing and that is what feeds into this narrative what we need is a lot more clarity and people just being on the same page that this is what needs to happen for the future thanks here really passionate response there. Um, um, apologies to any uh, unanswered questions left in the chat, but I think we're gonna have to call it there um, as we've hit 1.59. Thanks so much to all of the panelists for talking today. It's been a really lively and interesting discussion. And, um, and I look forward to sharing the report with all of the attendees um, and hope to hear from you all soon. So thank you very much.